Hey, everybody, it's Pete A. Turner, executive producer and host of the Break It Down Show. I am waiting on Rob. We're, you know, as always, technical, technological things. Um, ah, they always make things tough. So we are working on Rob. He's trying to link. I'm in the studio. He's you're trying to be in the studio, and, and that's just how these things go. If you guys don't know Rob Nyer, I guess I could spend a minute or two talking about him. Rob is one of the first real internet bloggers but his blog was on espn.com slash mlb so he wrote about baseball quite a lot and he's written a lot of books uh here's the latest book and it's from a few years ago but i think it um it gets after what we're uh what we're talking about today it's called powerball let me grab this thing and throw it up here and it's on amazon it's kind of rob and you sitting at a game together and talking about the modern state of the game and uh, Rob is just such a gifted, gifted writer. It's it's fun. I'm going to add him to the stream here. Um, hey, Rob, can you hear me? Okay, I sure can. Okay, good. we don't have a camera image, but that ultimately isn't that big of a deal. I can give you an image. I didn't prepare for. Uh... Look. Oh, okay. And when I do this, <laughs> you're going to get my bottom of my face. <laughs> the problem is, if we're going to talk about current baseball, I need to look things up. And... Okay. That'll well, be... turn your turn your camera off, and we'll just uh, we'll just rock it because I want to talk about current baseball, and I want you to be able to look things up because I'll be You're very kind. Up. I will try to add an avatar so at least people can see something. Yeah, we we need we need a avatar. Yeah, <laughs> uh, I was telling everybody about your book Powerball, and one of the things that I want to get into, and I'm just sort of vamping here while you get yourself set up. Um, I guess the first thing I want you to do is say, "Hey, this is Rob Nyer, and you're watching the Break It Down Show." I didn't hear a word you said. I don't know why you're on mute, but you oh, you're on mute. Why are you on mute? Okay. This is Rob Meyer, to... and you are watching the Break It Down show. Yes. Uh, and so Rob Rob and I go back a number of years now, and then uh, a quarter century I've been reading Rob's work. And so it's really, I mean, it's incredible when you think about how long it's been that you've been uh, doing the baseball thing. And your book Powerball, which came out a few years ago, kind of gave us a state of baseball. Do you feel like that book needs updating? I mean, maybe you do or don't get to write that book, but has the game changed uh, dramatically? Because I know in the last 10 years, it sure has. Well, I would say that most of what I wrote in the book still applies today, except that everything, there's more of everything, mm -hmm. more strikeouts. Uh, the game has slowed down even more. Now, what I would love to see is and not that i would write this but i think some things are going to change over the next year or two we'll see i mean i wrote a long passage about the extreme infield shifting well there's even more shifting now right. than there was when i wrote the book three years ago even though at the time people were were asking the question have we reached peak shift and the answer was no not even close <laughs> but yeah. next year the shifts are going away for the most part. So that's going to create real change in the game, at least visually. It's not right. clear statistically how, how big the changes will be, but certainly statistically or visually, it will look different for people who pay attention. And of course, the other big change is supposedly there will actually be time limits that are enforced for pitchers and hitters and that should lead to a, a, a great number of changes in the game, both visually and statistically. Now you can, I think, assuming that, again, the rules are enforced, you can make some pretty accurate predictions for what that will look like in the majors because it's been tested in the minors for mm -hmm. a while now. But there will be some real differences, and I could. One of the things that's going to happen, most obviously to baseball fans, is next spring you're going to hear and read a huge number of complaints from major league players who are not ready for these changes. Right, but they're coming. What when we look at the changes that are coming, there's a lot of stories about it, and one of them is uh, larger bases, which you know. Um, maybe add some safety. I don't, I don't know how viable that is, but you know, whatever, there's a little bit more space. The, the thing that I find uh, puzzling is, you know, back, um, back when we were young kids, Ricky Henderson was out there 
And he not only is the greatest base stealer, but he took third base at will almost. I mean, he was just so good at it. And that seems to be a lost art. And I, I believe that, it's not that people are not faster than Ricky Henderson was today, maybe even more fast. But now you can also figure out where the lead needs to be and how much time it takes. Why aren't people stealing third base more? It's an excellent question. I don't know why there aren't more steals of third, but there there are fewer steals generally. Right. And one of the things that theoretically baseball is working toward is more steals, whether that's second or third. And I think they're going to get there. That's one of the things that these changes are supposed to do is, is not only encourage stealing directly, but also create more space for players whose skills are speed based right these are all good things one of the i think if there was a if there was a a theme throughout my book it was that and i certainly hit this pretty hard in the in the in the conclusion baseball is a more entertaining game when there are more dip, more things happening you know the complaints about the com this complaint goes back a hundred years ring lardner famous for writing the you know know me al stories and, and and various other baseball stories along with musicals and plays and all those things he was complaining a hundred years ago that the home run was crowding out all the other things that baseball players mm. can be good at so actually the, the the running theme in my book is that nothing is new that's mm -hmm. really the running theme. Uh, everything we think we're seeing for the first time ha has has appeared in uh, perhaps in some other form earlier in baseball history. And the complaints about the home runs and strikeouts and how long the games take and how, how slow the pace has become, these all go back at least a century. Uh, but it's certainly, I think it's it's fair to say that it's a more entertaining game when you have home runs and strikeouts and steals and great plays by the infielders and uh, players stretching doubles into triples or trying to. Right. And I, I think that baseball is actually making some progress toward bringing some of those things back. When you think about stealing home, I think about most recently, like probably the biggest play that I'm, I'm aware of right now off the top of my head in like a critical moment was uh, in the series between the Dodgers and the Rays where uh, Manuel Margot takes off from third to steal home. And mm -hmm. I don't know, by, by less than three inches, he's out. <laughs> and only because everything that Kershaw, uh, Kershaw didn't instantly balk, which easily could happen. And the ball gets there, and they only had to do a replay to even see how close that play was. If his lead was six inches longer, I mean, he's safe, and they probably don't need a replay, right? Right. So is this simply a matter of uh, we haven't got the data yet to figure out how big? Because often I'll look at the lead at third base, like when you are, are able to see that shot, and you see that the person is is closer to the bag than the third baseman is. And, you know, and all the variables that go into, like, what is – like the perfect lead size, you know, for someone who's as fast as Margot is, but that was such an exciting play. And when people talk about all oh, the Dodgers, you know, won, won a 60 game world series and it doesn't count as much, Like there were, there were at least four plays that happened to go the Dodgers way. You know, you can go back to any world series. I mean, I always think about Verlander, uh, you know, getting rocked for three home runs by, by Panda, right? Like that's not supposed to happen, but it did. And it sort of defined that World Series that went the Giants' way instead of the Tigers' way. So these these micro things are so exciting. Uh, can we capture what those things are uh, in terms of, you know, sabermetrics, analytics, statistics, and say, hey, uh, even though we um, shouldn't take these chances to steal home statistically, uh, let's find a way to encourage teams to do it through the rules so that we have more of these instances that are just incredible and it's so exciting. Well, first of all, I'm glad you mentioned Verlander. I, I just had on my podcast this week, Tyler Kepner, who's got a great new book about the World Series. And I learned something in Tyler's book that I should have already known, or if I knew it, I'd forgotten it. But let me ask you this question. Hmm. Pete, do you know how many World Series games, Justin Verlander has won. 
I'm guessing the number is zero. The number is zero. He is. Yeah. He is. He has won 14 postseason games. Been fantastic. Eight and one in division series games. Six and four with a solid ERA in championship series games. He is 0 and six. That's crazy. 568 ERA in World Series starts. Now, is that because there's something wrong with Justin Verlander? No. No. He just hasn't pitched well in those seven starts or particularly yeah. well. Uh, you know, the same, he, he's got that monkey on his back, just like Clayton Kershaw did until last right. year. And these things happen. It, 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 that's, you, you, you asked about measuring things. Let's think about that lead from third base and, and what it needs to be to make it home. Well, you can measure various things. What you're not going to be able to measure is exactly how long it takes the pitcher to release the ball. Mm. Now, you can you, you know what his average release time might be, but what if he sees you over there on third base and thinks, I better speed this up a little bit just in case. Right. You don't know if he's going to do that. Um, you don't know if he's going to throw a fastball or a curveball. Now, you can guess based on tendencies, but he's going to be guessing right along with you. He might be thinking, I better throw a fastball in case he takes yeah. off right now. So there are there are dozens of variables every time someone's thinking about stealing home or stealing third. Mm. And yes, you can measure all of those variables to some degree, but all you're measuring are tendencies and averages. So there will always be a significant amount of uncertainty, and that's what keeps the game fresh. That's why I never worry when somebody says, "Well, you're you're just you're 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 measuring the game to death." No, mm -hmm. you it's impossible to do that. I don't right. care how many analysts you have, and the Dodgers have more than anybody. Oh my gosh! I think uh, they'll never be able to figure out everything. That's why the Dodgers, as great as they are, they their chances of winning the World Series year in year out are not more than one in six or something because there are variables and there are other teams trying to do basically the same things that that they are yeah the uh the standard narrative is like you know the dot and there's there's these stories all the time across the board and, and granted i'm a dodger fan but i'm a baseball fan first and so it's like well they're just going to sign so and so you know and so and so because they can do it but that's not at all been their model their model is incredible like they they despite drafting at the back of the pack they constantly have a powerful farm system they uh, they do that dave duncan thing that he used to do but i think they're better at it now where they take cast offs people that are commonly available anybody could have had max muncie you know max muncie but they right. see something in that player chris uh, uh martin on the team you know you're like hey we can use you just get rid of that stupid fastball and just throw this slider <laughs> and so they're able to do that and that ensure they run a big a big roster and they stuff players on the disabled list that are in the injury list that probably aren't uh, as injured as they let on. All those things are happening, but they're not going to go out and just sign the top player because they're available. Well, that's exactly right. And the, the Dodgers have been a paragon of the the efficiency and I'm. I'm not coming up with the right words right now, but but it's been long suggested that whatever money you spend on analysis, you will more than make up for on the field. Mm. You know, I, I remember writing years and years ago, wondering why a team would spend a few million dollars on the 24th man on their roster yeah, a utility infielder, a relief pitcher, whomever it might be, but not spend a tenth of that right. to hire four or five analysts who could easily find players who do the same thing that the, that 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 player does, but for half the cost or a fourth the cost. I mean, it right. just it's it's always been cost of, in my opinion, it's always been cost efficient, incredibly mm -hmm. cost efficient to hire analysts, especially when you look at how much money is spent on players. But there are still, there are still a number of teams that have three or four people in their front office who 
work on analysis. Uh, it, I probably shouldn't say three or four because that's probably that that was probably true five years ago when I was working on on Powerball, or four years ago probably isn't now. But there are still teams. There are still vast disparities between some teams in terms of how many people they have in their front offices doing analysis. Now it it is true that you can't just hire twenty analysts and call it good. You've got to have someone who knows what to do with all the work that those people produce. Mm-hmm. You've got to have someone overseeing them. Uh, you got to have, and if you don't trust the analysis, it's not going to do any good. But the Dodgers and a few other teams, look, there's a, there's a pretty clear relationship. I just saw a graph recently where someone went through and essentially made a list, went through every team's personnel listings and counted how many people they had working on analysis. There was a pretty strong relationship between number of analysts and wins. Mm. Uh, <laughs> and and I think that, that that sort of speaks for itself. And what you're seeing recently is you'll see well the Royals just the Royals just fired their general manager and their owner said we have to do more analysis. Basically, um, the, the the Royals were successful seven eight nine years ago, not really doing a lot of analysis. Yes, they had a few people and they would say that we're doing it, but were they really? It's pretty hard to see that on the field other than those two seasons. And there are many examples like that. The question becomes then, how do you, you know, it's sort of an arms race Mm -hmm. uh, in a sense where, you know, is 10 enough? Yeah. Well, if you look at the Dodgers, 10 is probably not enough. Is 20 enough? Well, if if everybody has 20, then people are going to have... I don't know what the limit is. You can probably suffer from information overload. In fact, that's sort of one argument against having a lot of analysis mm-hmm. analysis in your organization. People would say, I heard this, I don't know how many times, paralysis by analysis. But teams like the Dodgers have proved that it doesn't have to work that way. If you have a the right system, the Astros are another great example, of course. If you have a, the right system in place, you probably can't have too much. You just need to ha- know what to do with it. Yeah, the uh, recently the Dodgers were featured on, um, you know, the game of the week on whatever channel it was. It, m- it must have been ESPN because they had the players mic'd up and uh, Mookie Betts, which, uh, by the way, I love that thing. You know, like, as long as it's not impacting the game, the, just that constant chat because the pace of baseball allows for that. You couldn't, couldn't really do that in football with the guys right. on the field. But uh, he's like, yeah, you know, I want to position myself and I, as a, as a softball and, you know, middling baseball player, you do get the sense you're like, there's something about this guy that makes me think I should stand over here. Right. You know, <laughs> you get a pattern and then I'll be damned, you know, here comes the ball, you know? Right. And so you're, you know, you're turning, you're thinking like Mookie Betts is professional at that, you know, where he sees it and he's like, yeah, but you know what? Dodgers are right more often than not. I got it. I, the numbers won out where I'm standing in the right spot, you know, at the right time. And that also goes to those, yeah, like why wouldn't you spend five million dollars? Because there's no limit to that. You can spend as much as you want on your on your uh, statistical analysis. And I guess one of the things you'd have to have is you'd have to have a, like a a skunk works where you're like, hey, Voros McCracken, go find guys who think outside of the box and bring us data that we don't have. And then you would think that they would employ this stuff in the minors as well to see like, hey, does this work at the major league level? Is this creating an impact? And then would you also discuss the the, the distance between, say, um, the Diamondbacks, you know, with Kirk Gibson, when they're like, wow, numbers are dumb versus, you know, a team that wins? Because I, I would imagine it, it's just a collection of micro differences that equal just a general trend towards winning as opposed to losing. I think that's basically correct, especially when it comes to the in-game decisions. I- I don't think that the the I, Bill James probably wrote about this thirty some years ago. Just in terms of in game decisions, which is to say pitching changes, whether we bunt now or not. Oh, now nobody bunts, nobody issues right. intentional walks, really. So those, in a sense, those those issues have been mooted to some degree. I think the pitching, the pitching decisions, the line decisions, there were. If, you know, if you study, here's another great example. If, if you study, and, and Bill or somebody else did this many years ago, the difference between the worst, literally the worst lineup you can put together 
i.e. the pitcher batting first back when pitchers batted, mm-hmm. your, your best hitter batting ninth, between the worst lineup and the best lineup really was far, far fewer runs and wins over the course mm-hmm. of the season than most people would, would have guessed. Maybe four or five or six over the course of a season, which now that sounds like a lot, except that you're never going to run out your worst lineup. Nobody's ever going to bat their pitcher first or their worst hitter first. Um, right. Actually, I think the Yankees did that in <laughs> in 1960 something with with Bobby Richardson leading off. But uh, basically, that essentially never happened. So the real fundamental difference between the best lineup you're going to consider and the worst you're going to consider is maybe two or three wins over the course of a season. That's not a huge difference. Mm-hmm. Right. But I think the the bigger differences are on the personnel side. You mentioned uh Max Muncie who anyone could have had for free. Chris right. Taylor is another one of those. Justin right. Turner is another of those. Uh who's the the Yankees pitcher th- this year? Nestor Cortez is that is that right? The, yeah. Uh he was out there for anyone. And in fact, I, he, you know, released multiple times, I think including yeah. by the Yankees year. Ago. Um, that's where you really derive your, it, it isn't pitching decisions. I know a lot of effort is invested or energy invested in figuring out how to best use your bullpen. And that's obviously important, but that's why you have 15 or 20 analysts. You can, you can have two or three people working on that. You can have another five people working on finding the next max month. That's right. where your real advantage is going to be because those players do make a difference all by themselves, two, three, four wins over the course of a season. So there, there are huge advantages to be gained on the personnel side. I think there's no question about that. If you find an advantage that's exploitable, and I'll use the A's as an example. When they realized that their um, the league was you know focusing on the bottom of the strike zone, and so they started identifying guys that crushed fastballs in the bottom of the strike zone. So the um, the the you know the the value of finding I don't know Chris Davis who's going to hit forty home runs because you're throwing the ball right where he wants it, you know changes. And now you see them working fastballs high in the strike zone. Right. Well, and that's why the work will never end. And I keep referencing Bill James. Probably I just read a chapter in, 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 a, in a new book about, about the Bill's baseball abstract. So Bill's on my mind even more than usual. But Bill writes again and again that no matter how much we think we know about baseball, there will always be an infinite number of things that we, we don't know about baseball, which is, I think, on its face true. But it, it it's... What makes it perhaps more true is that the game is always changing. You mm. can you can you can jump ahead a little bit, but if you're not careful, then you'll fall behind. And that that your 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 example of the low fastballs is, is a great one. It wasn't that long ago that the everybody was saying you got to keep the ball down. That'll keep guy hitting home runs. Well, that didn't work for <laughs> right. for all that long. And right. you're right. It, it was. I think it was, and I don't know if, how much credit he deserves for this, but certainly Brent Strom has received a fair amount of credit, a longtime pitching coach for a number of teams. Uh, Brent still gives me hell sometimes because I used to routinely mock him when he was the Royals pitching coach and their pitchers were terrible. <laughs> now, this was frankly a long time ago, and I was not nearly as humble as I am now, but... I still feel a little bit guilty, but I didn't know why the Royals pitchers were so terrible. I just knew their pitching coach was Brent Strom and, and their ERAs were all in the fives and sixes. And so, well, shoot, it must be his fault. Well, maybe it was, maybe it wasn't, but Brent Strom has now for more than a decade been one of the most successful pitching coaches in the game. And one of the things that he's spoken to me about, I think this is in, is in Powerball is he, he, has preached the effectiveness of the high fastball. And, you know, now people talk about spin rates. 10 years ago, we didn't have access. Nobody knew what a spin rate was. They they, right. they acknowledged the concept, but they couldn't precisely measure it, yeah. uh, except in a lab. And now, because of the technology that's out there, we know spin rate down to the 
I mean, 2,642 revolutions per minute, I think yeah. is an example of a, of a pretty typical spin rate or maybe not, not a typical one, but a, but a good spin rate on either a curveball or, or a fastball. And guess what? The more it's more fastball spins, the less it drops and the more deceptive it is. And that's something that Brent Strom, he, he, he learned that from, from, from Tom Seaver and Nolan Ryan 55 years ago. Right. Yeah. The access to that data, um, I remember reading like in the mid nineties, maybe it was the early two thousands where Greg Maddox was talking about how he experimented with how much pounds of pressure he would put on his fingertip to make his, uh, cut fastball or whatever pitch you wanted to call it move in a certain way, you know, and, and now heck we now, we now know there's seam shift. Like we didn't even realize or accept that Magnus of force was even Magnus force was even a thing, which by the way, for the audience, this is like the space around the ball. It's like a high and a low pressure zone. And so the ball goes towards the low pressure zone. It's just like flight. But now you realize like what the seam is actually doing, which helps you identify like these positions on the ball, if you can put this much here. And so this takes Greg's experimentation and now there's science to it. And you can also identify people that are built, you know, like a three finger Mordecai Brown, like, oh my gosh, this guy can put 40 pounds of pressure on this part of the ball, which will make it, you know, probably do this. And that is something that would probably blow away anybody in the pitching game from like 1995 back, you know, we're like, what we can do all of this now. And, and, you know, these guys are such fine athletes. They can do things like make these nano adjustments to how they approach the, the craft, like letting their foot fall uh, an inch and a half further forward or whatever that thing is going to be. The adjustments are a lot more precise, at, at least as far as I understand as a layperson. Yes, that's right. And they, there's this whole, this whole discipline called pitch design, which has, of course, always been practiced. I don't mean practiced in the sense of we, I practice it. I mean, it's always been done by pitchers. Pitchers have always taught each other, oh, if you put your finger here, you, like I do, your pitch, your changeup might do the same thing my do, mine does. And that, that, that goes back for as long as there have been pitchers. But now it can be done with such precision because of the high speed cameras because of the all the other technology that's that's out there you know what's really fascinating to me is we have assumed and it's i i still can't really understand why this wouldn't be true and i i think intuitively i think it is true that the pitchers will are and will remain ahead of the hitters because the technology is more conducive to to improving the art of pitching. Mm. But at the same time, what, you have these huge, massive strikeout rates and these pitchers coming up with all these amazing new pitches, or if not new, at least uh, designed pitches. And yet at the same time, Aaron Judge can hit 62 home runs. <laughs> and the hitters are learning to hit 103 mile an hour fastballs, which 20 yeah. years ago, you just said, no, it's impossible. If you do 100, 103, you're just you're stuck you can't hit 103 no they do hit 103 so and i i don't know how they're able to do that um i don't really understand the extent to which technology is, is helping the hitters although i'm certain that it it must be somehow i think part of it is is just that they and this has always been true the hitters uh if they if they practice against it they ultimately can be successful against it I, I don't really think that pitchers threw more than 90 95 75 years ago and that if you had unleashed a 100 mile an hour fastball in 1927 or 1932 1942 uh it, the hitters would basically have been helpless yeah that isn't the case anymore and i think in part that it's not because Hum, hu, humans eyes have gotten better it's because they they learn how to they, they can make the adjustment to, to to that sort of speed uh and you know we do wonder what the limit is it wasn't that long ago that, that there were people who were smart people saying well yes pitchers can throw 100 we've seen a couple of guys who can do that but we think that 105 might be the 
the actual physical limit? Well, I think we probably have to acknowledge that 105 is not the physical limit. I'm not sure it's possible to measure what the physical limit of the human uh, body is at this point. But I'm also not sure that if somebody threw, threw 110, there wouldn't be a hitter someplace that could hit a hit 110. So yeah. it's really interesting to watch it all happen. I just wish we could watch it all happen without so many strikeouts. Gary Sheffield would hit it if it hundred came 110. <laughs> <laughs> he wouldn't. He wouldn't care. He'd be waggling his bat while it came up. Mm-hmm. He was just so fast. Bring it the, on. Uh, um, and there's so many things I want to ask you about because it's, it's a fascinating time. But my buddy Brian Tice is listening. He's a Giants fan, and um, they picked up Farhan Zidi, and rightfully so because he's had a lot of success. And this is one of the, the the stabilizing things that happens, like when the Dodgers are just you know Billy Gasparino is is developing all these players in the minor leagues. Someone's going to say, "Hey, Billy, here's double the check. Come on over here and do this for us, right?" And so you have to go out and develop your development people as well. So someone like Farhan comes into the Giants, and and let's not call the Giants a small market team. I don't know how they got that moniker. This is one of the biggest markets in the nation. And there's a lot of money in that market, especially. So these guys can have a bigger budget if they choose to, which is a limiting factor. And maybe you're not as uh, efficient as the Dodgers are when you first come in. But um, one thing that Farhan does that's really uncomfortable for the fans until you see the success of it is he lifts the floor of the team, right? And, you know, he's like builds a 60-man squad. And he's always tinkering and improving the access to major league players but also not getting tied into long-term contracts that are going to damage the team two, three, four years. So he's constantly playing this very tactical game, but he's, he's also looking ahead. Um, But it's uncomfortable. And then can you reliably replicate that system? Uh, Andrew Friedman did, right. But, but he also went to a team that was wonderfully provisioned and willing to do that. Yeah, that's right. I don't know that, that Andrew Friedman, I mean, if he had remained with the Tampa Bay Rays, maybe they're winning 95 games every year instead of 85 or 90. I don't know. Uh, I think that what the Rays have done since he left is maintain their large analytical staff. And mm. I mentioned the Dodgers earlier, and uh, who else did I mention that with a, with a with a huge team of analysts? Well, the Rays are right up there too. They're basic. They're one of the few teams that spends very little money, but also has a huge team of analysts. And you know, it seems so obvious. You think that every team that didn't want to spend much money on analysts or on, on their roster because players are so expensive would instead spend a tiny fraction of an of a typical MLB payroll. Mm. So they could at least have more analysts than almost everybody else, uh, but they don't. Uh, and I should mention, you know, you don't have you don't have to do it that way. Uh, there are different ways to, to win. The in, the the Guardians, for example, actually, at least if if I'm reading the report correctly, have quite a small staff of analysts, and yet they're also competitive year in year out, as the Rays are, with a relatively tiny payroll. So Mm -hmm. there are different ways to do it. I think it, a lot of it stems just from your leadership. Who's your GM? uh, What sort of information do do they, do they need to be successful? Uh, There's not a one size fits all. Everybody's different. One of the things that I have sort of internalized in my day job as the commissioner of a baseball league is that every situation is 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 different. P- people looking up from the outside might think that basically all major league organizations are different are, are roughly equivalent aside from market size, just as they might as I might have thought that basically every collegiate summer team in my league, the West Coast League, are essentially the same. But once you are among, the organizations, you realize that there's a different, there are different dynamics at play everywhere. So it's, it's not really helpful to think of major league baseball or major league baseball's 30 teams as some sort of monolith where there's a standard way of doing business and all the owners are motivated by the same things. Um, and there's one way to succeed or maybe two. No, 
there are 30 different dynamics and probably half as many ways to be successful. Yeah. I I want to bring in, uh, speaking of being successful, I want to bring in Aaron Judge. You know, the Yankees are not uh, the team that they once were. And, and Cashman's been around forever. He knows how to build a team and win championships. He's done it. But he's got this problem where uh, his guy turned down a $30 million a year average value contract and then went out and had one of the greatest offensive seasons of all time. But And this blows me away every time I ever think about this. Aaron Judge is only two years younger than Mike Stanton. You know, so he's he's really not a young player, you know, come uh, opening day next week. And so you're going to have to pay this guy in excess of seven years and 20, 210 million. Um, I, I'd be terrified if I was Brian Cashman to either let him go or sign him. I mean, it's just there's no way there's no way uh, looking at his size and the history of players of that size. They just don't age well. Maybe Aaron will be different. Maybe it's a different time. But he also has a player that has has not played all the time every year, right? Like about half the time he gets hurt for a significant portion of the season. What are your, like, if you're Brian Cashman, what do you do with this guy who could be the next Yankee captain, but also could be, you know, completely just used up at 35? Well, and I'm glad you mentioned Stanton because he's an object lesson. Now, I will say <laughs> I'm not ready to give up on Stanton, who is signed through 2027, is not right. having a good year. His, he's barely been above replacement level uh, this season. But he's also coming off Stanton a, a, a long string. Well, I shouldn't say he's coming off a long string of good seasons because in 2019 and 2020, he was basically hurt all the time. Right. But he was really good last year at 31. The problem is, of course, Stanton is signed for another, what? He's signed through 2027. 20, That's five more years yeah. after this one. And right. How many years is Aaron is Aaron Judge going to command on an open market? Six, seven, mm -hmm. eight years? Yeah. Do I want to be tied to that contract personally if I'm a GM or no, I don't. But if I'm if I am Brian Cashman, I'm actually feeling pretty good about this situation because if I'm Brian Cashman, it's not my decision. It's not my money. I go to right. my boss, presumably the owner of the team, and I say, here's basically how many years and how many dollars it will take to lock Aaron Judge in for, right. and people will say, well, he's going to be a Yankee for, for life. Well, that's not how the, the real world works, but here's what it would take for us to lock him in for another six, eight, 10 years, whatever it is. What do you think? Here's what I think. I think that he'll probably have be an excellent player for most of those seasons. And for a few of them, he will either be ineffective or he'll be hurt, especially as he gets into the out years of the contract. This is an ownership decision. It is not a general manager decision. This is not That's baseball 50 years ago. Um, I can't remember who it was. You know, Scott Boris, everyone's favorite baseball yeah. agent he, he'll just flat out say sometimes this is not a, a gm level decision this is an ownership decision he'll go straight to the owner and sell right. the owner on a kind you know how did albert pools get that massive contract that worked out so poorly for the angels that was scott boris pitching albert pools to to the owner not the general manager and that's that sort of thing has happened. And when when you are talking about three hundred million dollars, mm. <laughs> that's not a GM level decision. That's an owner level decision. And if I'm Brian Cashman, I just I I get the, the best information that I can get. I show it to my ownership, and I let and and then they make the decision. And then if you're Brian Cashman, yeah, you you wear that decision. If it doesn't work out, you say. I'm responsible because that's your part of your job, but in, in but in real life, everyone who pays attention realizes that this wasn't Brian Cashman's decision; it was the owner's decision. And so, I, if I'm Brian Cashman, I'm pretty happy because um, there are a couple of things that can happen here: um, we let him go and spend that money on something else, or we can sign him and have a probably a great player for a few years. Yeah. Do you? 
I mean, and you think about like whatever it takes and, and, and maybe I, I do like what, uh, some, some teams do the Dodgers are one of the teams that do this. They're like, Hey, how about we'll just break the annual value number by a lot, but give you a shorter term. So you can still have another payday and we'll give you lots of player options, but, um, let's call this 50 million a year for the next five years. And uh, we'll just wow everybody with this thing. It'll be our commitment to you. And we'll give you three options on the way out. First two years belong to both of us. The next three are going to be up to you. You know, it's an, an offer like that to someone like Judge, gosh, that's, that would be incredible. I would, I would have to think you'd have to consider that seriously. Can't hear you. Can you hear me? Can I hear me? Something's happened here with my technology. Uh, hmm. I know, you know, Rob might have a problem with his Wi-Fi, so I'm going to talk to you all. What do you all think? Would you sign Aaron Judge? Put a comment in, and while we wait for Rob to come back, we will uh, we will talk and discuss that. Uh, my buddy Charlie and I have a lot of conversations. He's a Toronto uh, resident and a Braves fan, and uh, he is, I call him salty because he gets salty and mad at his team never believes in the Braves and they go out and win and beat everybody. But one of the things about the Braves that is incredible is uh, they've built a very solid and productive um, franchise that's constantly competitive. And in that competitive nature of the Braves is not because the Braves are in a small market and they're out thinking they're just well managed and they have been for a long time and they're the world champions right now, right? They're the uh, reigning champs. And so it is possible to accomplish um, this this winning attitude through development of young players, which the Braves do very well, and also to mitigate your long term risk, right, and have some flexibility. This is one of the things that the uh, the Braves and the and the Dodgers and a lot of teams you know, mitigating that that long term risk. And this is that judge contract, right? Do you just go out and sign uh, two players for twenty five million? I think Rob is back. So Rob, I was talking about like if you gave. Um, <clears throat> You offered, and I'm just making up numbers here, but you offered him uh, five years at 50 million a year, and just did a shorter term, a lot of player options to, uh, to let him opt out and get paid, and and do that to mitigate the long term risk of a, a crappy 41 year old player who's hitting 15 home runs a year. I, I'm a big fan of those deals, and I think that a lot of teams also are. The players tend to not be fans of those deals because their egos come into it. Mm. Aaron Judge, I think, is going to want to come out of this winter as the highest paid player in baseball, or if not the highest paid, well, yes, the highest paid, but what he's really going to want to probably be able to, his agent and he are going to want to be able to say, we have the biggest contract in Major League history. Right. And when they, when they, and they measure bigness by the, the total number of guaranteed dollars. I can't tell you how many times doing some research that I've come across players trumpeting the fact that they are now the highest played, highest paid player. Yeah. So I, I think that's one of the reasons why you heart, we, we don't see many of those deals where sure there are teams that instead of giving you four, four years and 120 million, how about three years mm. and 95 million or a hundred million, but the players typically want to go for the security. Yes. But also the the biggest, dollars yeah. um it, there's and you know agents want to set the market players want to be able to say they're the highest paid or have the, the biggest contract ever but i think from the team perspective absolutely but the second smartest thing is just not to sign players for those big contracts at all right <laughs> we've just we've seen it so many times yeah um uh, and look you can argue it's just the price of doing business i think theo epstein maybe has said that if you make, if you just make rational decisions, you'll never sign anybody. Right. Which is why you have to go to your ownership and say, Hey, yes, we're overpaying. But if we really want this guy, if we want to make a splash this winter, we have to overpay. We saw the Padres do it a few years ago. Basically none of those deals worked out, but it added a, an air of legitimacy to the, to the, to the franchise. It resulted in a greater attendance. And I'll, I suspect that if you went to their ownership or their general manager today and said, was it worth it? They would say, yes, it was worth it. Now, they're 
obviously biased, but I, I think it's, I think that teams regret those big contracts only when it completely blows up in their faces. Shoot, the Angels might not even regret the Albert mm. Pujols contract because at least he was able to stay in the lineup and play, even if he wasn't very good for most of those years. Yeah, um, it's funny. I, I'm looking at the uh, the numbers over here. Uh, Jason Hayward, a guy that that Theo Epstein signed, and you know they had some some moments of brilliance together. And Gene Gene Carlos Stanton, these guys came up right around the same exact time. They were both very young, uh, precocious baseball style, and they are very similar in their in their WAR up to date. Like um, I think Jason, I'm just looking a second ago. He has like 44. No, uh, Giancarlo has 44, and Jason has 38. So these guys are very similar. But neither of these guys have lived up to the big contract. And and uh, Giancarlo can go be below average for the next couple of years and let us all down by hitting no more than 25 home runs the next five years and, and be knocking at the door, if not past 500 home runs. It's crazy right. like what good can be and what great can be and the difference between the two. Yeah, that, that's right. And there are so many players, have always been so many more players with Hall of Fame ability than have actually wound up in the Hall of Fame. Right. It's just, we, we have this, we sort of, we can't help assume when a player is that good in their early to mid 20s that they'll always be roughly that good. But yeah. a lot of things can happen, and usually it's injuries. That's usually why. And I think we, most baseball fans understand how often pitchers get hurt or at least have mm -hmm. some awareness that pitchers get hurt. And many Dwight Gooden pops into, into mind just because he was the best pitcher in baseball, essentially at the age of whatever it was, 20, 21. And, and, you know, for various reasons, fell short of the hall of fame. But one of those reasons was that he got hurt and mm -hmm. got hurt more than once. And that's true of so many tremendously talented young pitchers we tend to forget that the same things happen with hitters, just not so dramatically. Dale Murphy, for example, and you could argue, you could make a strong argument that he belongs in the Hall of Fame, but he's not in the Hall of Fame right. yet because he just wasn't healthy after the age of whatever, 32, 33. Uh, clearly, there was more than enough ability there for a Hall of Fame career, but he wasn't able to stay healthy. And that's happened to innumerable players over the years. It's one of my, one of the things I've always sort of been interested in is just how many great players weren't able to stay healthy, even if we don't realize, because they kept playing. Most of the time, those guys will still play into their mid 30s, late 30s, sometimes even longer because there's so much talent that they're still good enough to play in the major leagues, but they're just not great players anymore. Uh, Ted Simmons is another one of those. Now, Ted Simmons is in the Hall of Fame, and I think deservedly so, but he wasn't a great player after the age of 30, 31, 32. He just hung around for a while. Yeah. And so people sort of, in his case, sort of forgot how great he was in his 20s. But again, there are many, many cases like that. Stanton might be one. Judge might wind up being one. Shoot, Mike Trout might be might wind up being one. I don't think so. But Trout has gotten hurt quite a bit mm -hmm. in the last few years. And it's not clear to me that he'll still be, that he'll be Hank Aaron or that he'll be Willie Mays or Frank Robinson. Still yeah. an incredibly effective player into his late 30s. Johnny Bench is one of those catcher guys too. Oh yeah, like Johnny Bench is a great. Example. Thirty-two, and then just hit a wall, you know. Yep. And there is a wall at thirty-two. There is something about baseball, and whether it was pitchers or hitters, and, and there is a definite change. And those that are able to hang around or able to still be good, and those things certainly happen. But if you haven't done it by thirty-two, your Hall of Fame chances, I, I would say, are, are going down. It's really interesting that that number constantly comes up as that's the last great season for this player. Hmm. I had not noticed that, but now I'm going to be watching for it. <laughs> Good. Um, I'm curious what you think, and we don't have to get into this too deeply, but Trevor Bauer fascinates me because he has this uh, case with this woman where there's uh, he said, she said, and it is gruesome. And 
it's also very hard to put into domestic violence because there's an agreed upon and the courts have kind of sided with Trevor on this. And so baseball comes down and gives him this massive penalty. And we're still trying to sort this out. 18 months. I don't know who knows whenever they're going to uh, come to an agreement, but this has not been as, as cut and dried as they wanted it to be baseball because um, well, I mean, they're still talking and they have to keep quiet about it, but also for Trevor power, this is not as cut and dried as he wants it to be too. And this is really going to, he's the first guy to really challenge uh, a penalty, a penalty under this policy. And gosh, I mean, when you think about people like Chapman shooting up his garage in a drunken fight with his, with his loved one, and you think, okay, that was pretty clear, but this is not. And so what do you think like is, and it's, Look, Trevor Bowers is his own bad guy. He plays a great heel, but I'm not sure that baseball is doing it, it, itself any service by taking an entire season to still not come up with a resolution on this. Thing. Well, gosh, um, I, I would say that I am. I will offer a few general thoughts ab about this, but I'll preface it by saying that when I used to write every day, I would work through basically everything as I wrote. And this is something that I never, this all happened after I wrote every day. So I didn't have to write specifically about this, or I think even maybe Chapman as well. Um, the, the Bauer situation is something I've never had to, I've never been sort of in a, in a position of having to work through my feelings about something like that, or my thoughts remotely like the Trevor Bauer situation. So it, it's a, it's a tough one for me. I would agree that what makes the Bauer situation tougher, it makes it, what makes it tougher for me to be sort of analytical is that it's such an ugly situation. The details are so difficult for me to relate to, isn't the right term, right. to be dispassionate about and analytical about. And also there are a lot of other things about Trevor Bauer that oh, I have found yeah. distasteful. Um, the, I actually used to admire some things about Trevor Bauer. His, you know, his, his, his personality has some attractive qualities, you know, his, his, his willingness to, to, to do things that upset teammates, coaches, because he thought it was the right thing to do for himself, for his professional future. And guess what? He was probably always right about those things. Yeah. yeah. And that's admirable. You know, the, 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 the ability to, or the willingness to stick to your guns, even though everyone's telling you that you're wrong, when you're sure that you're right. And, and, and there's something to be said for that, especially when it turns out that you, that you were right. But, you know, Bauer's treatment of women generally, uh, on social media in particular, was distasteful when it when it when it was revealed. And then this, of course, this this more serious matter is can be distasteful uh, depending on how you feel about various sorts of relationships. And I am not an expert. I would agree with you that. The whole thing has dragged on for far too long. Yeah. And I would assume that there are good reasons for that, uh, that there are legal issues involved. There are lawyers involved. It's not difficult to look out. and Look, there are, it's, 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 what is it now? It's um, almost two years and there are still many, many uh, defendants in the January 6th situation who have not come to trial yet yeah um why does our justice system and obviously trevor bowers situation is not just part of the official justice system but why do these things take so long uh, well we have a lot of rules we have a lot of laws we have a lot of lawyers um and we have a lot of people who want to make sure that they don't screw anything up that's why it takes so long, but it, it is, it is somewhat shocking that, I mean, even in, in something routine in major league baseball, when players are allowed to protest a ruling 
or a, a punishment that can take weeks to resolve. Uh, and, you know, part of that is the players association. Let's be honest. Um, yeah. I, I've the, in my opinion, the players association for all the, the good that it's done for the players over the, the decades can be an impediment to what I would consider justice or quick justice or, um, the, the health of the sport itself. So all these things sort of get stirred into the pot. And I don't know if there's anyone in particular to blame for Trevor Bauer's situation not being resolved yet. Um, the one more thought that I would have about all of this is that there are absolutely people who would rather that Trevor Bauer and Aroldis Chapman and other players over the years simply are never seen or heard from again. And I understand the emotional response um, and I share it sometimes. I, mm -hmm. I frankly wouldn't miss Trevor Bauer if he never pitched again. I also think, speaking more broadly, that It, it it doesn't behoove us as a society if we don't leave room for redemption. And sometimes I think we forget that part of the equation as well. And I don't mean to suggest that Trevor Bauer in particular deserves redemption. I don't know if he's capable of, of, of whatever you or I or someone else might think is required for yeah. personal redemption. But I do think that um, we need to create space for players who do things that, that, that we wish they wouldn't do or that they shouldn't do or that are unlawful. Um, yeah. Just as we would, you know, the reason that we tend to, I think, become less than charitable toward our athletes, some of us, Sometimes we're too charitable, by the way, too, yeah. too welcoming. Um, and sometimes we're not welcoming enough. I try to think of athletes as I would think of anyone else. You know, if someone gets in trouble with the law, some, someone does something terrible, we don't say, well, after you've served your, 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 whatever your prescribed punishment is, no, you can't go back and, and um, uh, pump gas. Right. You can't go back and be a stockbroker. No, we let those people do those things for the most part uh, once they've served their serve their penalty. Um, and I'm not sure if sports should be different, but I understand that sports are different. The standards are, are different, but we have to watch them. They make a lot of money. I get all those things, but I do think we also need to create some space where basically people can still live their lives and, and, uh, and make a living, even if they are professional athletes. Yeah. And I think that's a careful and contemplative way of saying it. Um, I, I think one other element we'd have to add, and then we'll move on from that is um, the, the woman in this in interaction has provided evidence that can be doctored. And then Trevor has posted a video of the two of them apparently poised, post some kind of sexual act and she's smiling and her face is not bruised. And so you have these conflicting things. And the next woman that targets major league baseball players as potential loved ones or people to, to get a, a windfall from it will not be the first nor the last. Right. And so you have all these competing things. It's just, it's just a mess. Okay. So I want to move on from that. Um, two things. One, I've got a little Verlander counter because I think he's going to hit 300 wins. Mm -hmm. And if not, he's going to come damn close. He's, you know, he's at, I think, 244 was the final number this year. And Correct. so he's he's going to pitch at least for three more years, probably for good teams. He, all of a sudden, you're within range. And uh, if he decides to do it, that is one of the things that 300-game winners do is they have to adapt and pitch late into a career, which is obvious because you need the numbers, but um, also that determination. Like, I remember uh, Jason Stark wrote a piece about Randy Johnson, and Randy – and he were talking about 300 and Jason's like, there's no way you'll get there. And Randy looked at him like he was going to murder him. You know, like, he was like, <laughs> I am going to get to 300. And if someone like that gets into that zone, I'm just going to bet on the uh, uh, Roger Clemens or Randy Johnson or, or uh, Justin Verlander. And then my, my last thing is, is um, what are your thoughts on if you added a rule that pitchers have to start the rotate their motion 
with both feet on the rubber and probably pointed towards home plate, would that create more opportunities to steal or would that, is that just a silly thing? But that seems like a small adjustment that would require just a little bit more time to get to the plate. Good question. I don't know. I've never thought about that one. I think there are some other things you can do. Um, and I think baseball is, is trying them like limiting the throws to first base, for example, is, is that's an easy one. And that's been, that's been tried out in the minors. It really, they've tried so many things in the minor leagues to enhance or encourage the running game. They've got a ton of data now and they should be able to just tinker around the edges here and there mm -hmm. and get, basically get the steals roughly where they want them to be. And I'm sure there are people listening saying, wait a second, you're going to let the people who run baseball just decide how many stolen bases they want to see. Well, to some degree, yes. And, you know, again, getting back to my book, I wrote about this a little bit until the last 20, 25 years. That's how baseball always worked. The people who ran the game would set, goals, whether they were concrete goals or just sort of hazy ideas for what they wanted the game to look like. And then they would make rules to, to do that. Now, did it always work? No. Were there unintended consequences? Of course, there always will be, right. but that's how the game was run. And then for the last few decades, baseball essentially stopped doing that. Hmm. Why? I'm not exactly sure. Part of it was the players association, but I think there were other things involved they're now getting back to that. And mm. I think it's a great development. Um, about As far as Verlander, I have no idea how many games this guy can win. Can he pitch until he's 45? Maybe. Uh, certainly Roger Clemens pitched into his early 40s and was incredibly effective. Um, I think if Verlander stays healthy, he could, he could do the same sorts of things. You think about Nolan Ryan, um, Randy Johnson, you mentioned mm -hmm. he pitched into his early forties and was still quite effective. Um, he could also pull a Mike Mussina. Who yeah. knows? Mike yeah. Mussina, his last season, he was 39. He won for the first time in his career. He won 20 games. Um, and he quit. Yeah. <laughs> he, he, you know, was it his best season? No, it wasn't his best season except for the winning 20 games part. Yeah. But it was one of his better seasons. He was still an excellent major league pitcher. What he did in his last season was right in line with what he'd done throughout his career. Yeah. And then he hung him up. That was enough. Yeah. And he finished at 270 wins. So I, I think that at, at, at Verlander's age, he has to stay healthy and he has to still want to pitch and i think you know Messina is in the minority most professional athletes not all but most want to play for as long as they can play some will play until they can't really play at all some will play right. until they can't play well but they want to keep playing Messina was an exception i love it hey anything in closing before i wrap this up anything in closing well i would just ask anyone who's got a good book idea to shoot it my way because i'm just about fresh out pete oh okay what kind of books <laughs> do you want to read no right mm, i have plenty to read that's not the problem i read too many books i need to start writing <laughs> more oh i got you writing okay yeah 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 i definitely want you to write more books i, it's always I appreciate fun. that do they have to be baseball books well i I have a couple of ideas for non-baseball books, but I think that would be even harder for me to to get people to read those than it has been the baseball books. Mm -hmm. So yes, baseball would be the priority. Um, but uh, if I don't come up with something, I'll probably just start writing something about woodpeckers or something that nobody will ever read except me. <laughs> I love it. Stand by while I wrap this up. Hey, thanks for watching the show. I really appreciate it. Right here, you can subscribe. Please do that. It makes the show grow. Hit that notification bell so you know which incredible guest is coming up next. Down below is the PayPal link. You can put a small subscription in. That is an enormous help. All that money goes right back into the show. And then right up over here are the next episodes you should listen to. Curated by...